Good morning. I'm Harold Holzer, director of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter. And on behalf of uh, Hunter President Jennifer Rabb, I want to welcome you to this very special session of the 2021 conference of the National Center for the Study of Collective Bargaining in Higher Education and the Professions. I want to thank the center's director, my friend Bill Herbert, who serves on the Roosevelt House Public Policy faculty, for again bringing the annual conference to Roosevelt House this year by necessity virtually, but still as the product of a very productive collaboration, whether in person or online. I had the pleasure of serving for three years on the National Center Board. I learned a great deal. I want to thank Bill for that opportunity. If we were together at the house, as I hope we will be again soon, I would be inviting you upstairs about now to the library where Franklin Roosevelt presided over the transition between his election as president in November 1932 and his inauguration the following March. Here, FDR and his key advisors built the foundational building blocks of the New Deal that were destined to bring the United States back from the brink of economic disaster. And here, New York State Labor Commissioner Francis Perkins arrived one day in February to be interviewed for the job of U.S. Secretary of Labor. It was a momentous interview. If chosen, she was destined to become the very first woman ever to serve in a presidential cabinet. Well, if the president-elect thought that Ms. Perkins would come begging for the opportunity, he quickly learned otherwise, because instead Ms. Perkins gave him a laundry list of what she required to accept the post, that he would support a minimum wage, maximum hours, an end to child labor, and a program to guarantee, to guarantee insurance for the disabled, and guaranteed income for older Americans, the program that within a couple of years became social security. So these historic ideas, these history altering commitments unfolded right here at Roosevelt House with a revolutionary labor secretary, Francis Perkins. That moment, that example has animated all that we do at Roosevelt House and of course our collaboration with the National Center. This morning, we're presenting a unique panel on Joe Biden and Catholicism in the United States, which is the title of a new book by Massimo Fagioli, who we're delighted is here with us today. I'm old enough to remember discussions of this very kind back in 1961, when heated arguments and fears erupted over the so-called divided loyalties of John F. Kennedy, either to the Pope or to the Constitution. And yet Joe Biden has written unselfconsciously, my idea of self, of family, of community, of the wider world comes straight from my religion. So fair game to discuss his frank statement and the book it has now inspired. With that in mind, it's a pleasure to welcome our speakers whose extraordinary full biographies are in your invitations to this event. I will introduce them more briefly. Massimo Fagioli, as I said, is our linchpin this morning. He's a professor of theology and religious studies at Villanova and a contributing editor to Common Wheel. He previously taught at the Jesuit Institute at Boston College and at the University of St. Thomas at St. Paul, Minnesota. So Dr. Fagioli, thank you for producing the book that has brought us together today and welcome to our own sacred ground, Roosevelt House. Heidi Schlum is executive editor of the National Catholic Reporter and was its former longtime national correspondent. She has notched 30 years experience in covering religion, spirituality, social justice, and women's issues. Welcome to Heidi. Now not to play favorites, but I am especially happy to welcome E.J. Dion, columnist for the Washington Post and a professor of government at Georgetown University. E.J. spent 
12 years with the New York Times, for whom he reported from Washington, Paris, Beirut, and Rome. But I got to know him more than 30 years ago when he served in the Times Bureau in another war zone, Albany, New York, at the time that I was doing public affairs work for another contemplative Catholic politician, Mario Cuomo. So EJ, great to see you again, albeit virtually, and we hope we can welcome you in person to Roosevelt House one day soon. Our moderator this morning is Paul Moses, another veteran journalist whose resume includes work as a reporter and editor for New York Newsday, where he was part of a team that won the Pulitzer Prize for spot news reporting. He is a professor of journalism emeritus at Brooklyn College, and he too contributes to Commonweal and other publications. His books include An Unlikely Union, The Love-Hate Story of New York's Irish and Italians. What a group, what a distinguished group. I can't wait to hear them. Welcome all. Thank you, Bill Herbert, for bringing these experts together. Now it's a pleasure to hand the mic to Paul Moses. Well, that, thank you very much, Harold, for that uh, very engaging uh, introduction to hear the story of uh, Francis Perkins and uh, Roosevelt House, especially. Um, are we all on board? Yes, we are. Uh, so I'm very pleased to uh, be able to introduce uh, this panel to you um, uh, and to hear from Massimo Fagioli about Joe Biden and American Catholicism. Um, we'll start out with uh, some remarks from uh, Massimo, then we'll hear briefly from uh, Heidi and EJ. Then we'll open up a discussion and, and feel free at any time to uh, send us a, a question. Um, you can uh, do that through the Q&A function on your screen, but, but not the chat, I'm, I'm informed. Uh, that doesn't work uh, as well. So please use the Q&A function uh, and we, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to your questions and we look forward to them. So uh, why don't we start? Massimo, can you begin? Sure. So thank you very much to Bill Herbert, to the National Center, and to my co-panelists, uh, Heidi and EJ and Paul for, for accepting this invitation. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure. Um, so we are four months in this presidency. And I look back uh, almost a year when the idea of this book came up. and. Uh, and at the beginning, I didn't feel comfortable with this idea because I'm Italian. Of course, I came to this country in 2008. Uh, I, I'm still new in some sense, uh, but I thought it was an, an important moment, the possible election of Joe Biden, the second Catholic president of the United States. Um, and as an historian, I started and I decided to do this book because if something happens only twice in more than two centuries, uh, it means that there's a certain relevance. And it's not just a relevance from the point of view of uh, national history uh, of, or presidential history. I thought there was a very specific and peculiar moment in American Catholicism that made this campaign of last year and the election uh, a critical moment to uh, observe a few phenomena. And so here there are uh, usually when we address the role and the relevance or irrelevance of, uh, of Catholicism in public life, um, it tends to be reduced to issues of, of sexual morality or the culture wars uh, very strictly narrow down to sexual issues or more recently gender issues uh, uh, or since the, the Obama administration on the freedom of religion, the freedom of, of speech for the church and so on. This is true of course, but there is a huge set of issues that on purpose tend to be minimized uh, and, and, and ignored. And this is, I believe, the political uh, relevance of having uh, a Catholic like Joe Biden in the White House. Uh, 
so I believe that this is has been a very different election and this is a very different presidency from the one of John Kennedy in 1960, but also from other Catholic candidates. And, and this is in the first chapter of, of the book. I mean, Al Smith in 1928 and John Kerry in 2004. Why is this different? It's different because in 1928, in 1960 for JFK and in 2004 for John Kerry, there wasn't something that is very specific to the very complicated relationship between American Catholicism and the Vatican uh, of these last few years, which is this. It's old story if we want that there is uh, a political uh, division or diversity of inclinations uh, among US Catholics in, in, in this very unique political system, which is a two-party system. That's not new. What's new is that there has been also a fracture in the Catholic communion with it, its epicenter in the United States around the very legitimacy of Pope Francis. This is something new because if, if there's something that is typical of Catholicism, and I should say, if there's something very specific of American Catholicism historically in these last two centuries is the um, unquestioned legitimacy of the Pope, whoever he is. This is something that has gone away in these last eight years since Pope Francis was elected. Why was that? And this goes back to the importance of having Joe Biden in the White House. It is not really about the usual sexual issues on, on LGBT or marriage or divorce or contraception. There is at the center of this fracture within the Catholic community that has its center in the United States there is a set of, uh, of teachings, of doctrines that are at the center of the so-called Catholic social doctrine or, or, or Catholic social teaching that have to do with labor, with work, with workers' rights, with a certain understanding of the, of the role of government in the economy, uh, of, the, of the capitalistic system, uh, of international relations on the environment. This is something new because uh, there is a very long tradition in the Catholic Church's teaching on those rights. For example, workers' rights. One goes back to Pope Leo XIII, 1891. I mean, workers' rights, it's not something new. What's new is that a certain unity among Catholics even in this country, on those uh, core ideas of Catholic social teaching are no longer uniting Catholics, but they are dividing Catholics. This is something that's new because we always had Catholics that were a bit more pro-capitalism or a bit more, but that has reached a point of, of, uh, of leading important sectors of American Catholicism to waging a campaign really uh, against Pope Francis and not just in terms of uh, a dissent or a criticism, but I mean, really aiming at undermining the very legitimacy of, of this Pope. This is important politically to understand this country, the election of 2020, and this presidency, because this affects directly the, the kind of political legitimacy that the second Catholic president has. This is a problem. It's one of the many problems that John Kennedy did not have, because John Kennedy did not have the problem of Roe v. Wade, uh, of gay rights, he did not have uh, many of the typical problems that now uh, make the life of a Catholic politician and uh, the national life 
very difficult. But John Kennedy did not have this real division in two political cultures that are not really slightly different interpretations of one same Catholic doctrine. They are really in the business, I, I would say personally, from the, the side of, 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 uh, of, uh, of uh, Catholics in the Republican Party, are in the business of rejecting core fundamental ideas of the Catholic social teaching uh, on workers' unions, on living wage, on the environment. This is something that is politically very, very complicated and relevant, but also it's historically uh, quite new. It is uh, striking because again, there was at least formally, at least on the surface, a unanimity on the importance of the Catholic social teaching. It's no longer there. And, and I would say this, it's not really because Pope Francis is different from John Paul II or different from Pope Benedict. He is different, but that's not the most important point. This fracture, it's because of what I describe in the book as a metamorphosis of American Catholicism that is no longer the same Catholic Church that had a fundamental unity, a moral unity, but also theological, doctrinal unity that has been there, I would say, until the end of the 20th century. And in these last 20 years, more or less here, uh, the chronology here is, uh, can be disputed, but there has been a rupture, not with the tradition of the church itself, but within the communion of Catholics in this country, this makes this presidency uh, a very complicated exercise because in some sense, uh, the uh, very complicated moral and legal issue of abortion is an issue that we know its, its, its contours. So there's a certain predictability in some sense on the arguments and so on. What has become unpredictable is what uh, Catholics on the more conservative side, on the anti-Francis side might resort to, to make an argument against Catholic social teaching. This is something very shocking for a Catholic theologian, Catholic historian. So here, uh, one of the typical phenomena uh, within political cultures in, in this country in these last few years included within Catholic circles is the rise of libertarianism. And one can think whatever one wants uh, about libertarianism, but it is not disputable that it's incompatible with Catholicism. Catholicism as a very different take on the role of government, on state, in the business of protecting the common good. Catholicism can be well liked or not, but it is eminently anti-libertarian. And so this has become again, one uh, argument, which is a, an incredible uh, turnaround from the age of, uh, of FDR, uh, who thought the New Deal also thanks to important Catholic theologians in this country. This has become now much more difficult to think and not because Catholicism has lost the tradition, but, but because that kind of contribution would be seen not as a Catholic contribution, but as a politically charged and devise a contribution. This is a, a very, a very different scenario. Uh, so this has this this Catholic descent on fundamental values that that really touch the lives of workers, of consumers, and first of all of citizens in this country every day. It has gone from a purely theoretical level to a very practical level. It affects 
uh, if you work in a certain kind of, of industry, uh, it affects your freedom to work with, with certain rights because we know that the Catholic anti-Francis faction uh, is not exactly uh, a, I mean, a ragtag team of improvisers. It is well-funded, it, it is well-organized, they strategize. Uh, and so this has become something that goes beyond the, I mean, Catholic internal business. It has become a national issue. And one of the most important things that I think we will see is how Joe Biden, as a second Catholic president, he navigates uh, this very divided uh, uh, intellectual and, and also a political uh, situation, which again is new because uh, uh, values uh, and, and orientations that could be divisive once in this country between Catholics and non-Catholics, they have become divisive now, even within Catholicism. And so that is historically speaking, is a very remarkable uh, turning point. And the future is not clear, but in, in this moment, Joe Biden also because of, of the pandemic, this I mean, country that needs to be rebuilt in some sense, will have to make some choices, uh, and has made some choices already, actually, that uh, really send a signal on what kind of Catholic is, what, what kind of Catholic culture, Catholic social doctrine he embodies. Uh, and this is really part of the anti-Biden sentiment of some Catholics. Again, it's not just abortion, it's, it's the overall Catholic package that this president he is presenting, and that has consequences that go way beyond the U.S. bishops or the U.S. Catholic universities and so on. It has become really nationally relevant. So I, th I think I, I will stop here. I thank you for your patience. And I, I, again, I thank you, my co-panelists, for, for this opportunity, and I'm looking forward to hearing from them. Thank you. Thanks very much, Massimo. Um, and uh, Heidi Schlumpf, uh, Massimo referred to a very practical level uh, in that, how this impacts on us. And, and, and it reminded me uh, of your reporting on the flow of money, uh, where this pretty big money kind of behind this campaign that is somehow involves both Pope Francis and, um, uh, and Joe Biden. Uh, and I, yeah, I think you've done the best reporting on on that that subject. So um, I'm really happy that you're you're here to uh, to uh, you know respond to uh, to what Massimo said. Uh, thank you, Paul. It's so great to be here with you and with EJ and Massimo. Um, and and certainly, I want to give credit to the whole team at NCR for the reporting that we've been doing on the connections between kind of the religious right in the Catholic Church and uh, the various financial uh, connections as well as uh, people connections. So um, I used to say, uh, when I came back to journalism in 2017, after being in academia for about a decade, I said, oh, I came back to journalism because of two men uh, and they were Pope Francis and Donald Trump because talk about two newsmakers. I mean, it was the I ideal for a person covering the religion political beat. Um, I'm much happier today to say that I stay in journalism, maybe because of two men, and now it's Pope Francis and Joe Biden. Um, it's just as newsy, um, but without the constant threats to our democracy, although that we're not totally clear on that yet. Um, I'm struck by, and I know uh, you're not very good at the whole product placement thing, Massimo, so I'll, I'll say, um, I read your book when, uh, before it came out, I, I blurbed it in the front and so read it, I'm, trying to remember when that was, but it was a while ago um, before Christmas. And then to read it again now after the 100 days, like you said, four months in, I was struck by how um, kind of my, at least my perceptions or maybe some of the media perceptions of Joe Biden's Catholicism have changed a bit. So during the campaign, I think a lot of 
what we were looking at in terms of Joe Biden being a Catholic was personal. So like you said, unlike previous Catholic candidates for presidency, for the presidency, he was open about, he didn't keep his Catholicism private. He didn't try to uh, separate that and say, well, it doesn't have anything to do with me as a politician. Um, obviously that didn't work very well for previous candidates, specifically uh, Kerry. So um, I think there was a real honesty and authenticity about the way that he would speak about his faith. And so much of that comes from his background of his faith being really important to him in the many areas of his life where he's experienced suffering. And so you refer to him as Biden the comforter at some point. And I just think there's a whole generation of Catholics, many of them are NCR readers, uh, longtime readers, who really uh, resonated or saw themselves reflected in the kind of Vatican II Catholic that uh, Joe Biden is and, and was on the campaign trail. He was very good at using language, um, whether he was quoting you know, the Pope or saints or on eagle's wings um, and symbols. Um, one of the things that really struck me where I said, man, I just, I know this guy. He was coming out of mass in Delaware and just the way he had the bulletin rolled up in a tube, you know, and was walking out, he's just like every, every other person, right? You know, um, so what he didn't do was use his faith on the campaign trail in this culture warrior way um, that, you, that you've talked about, Massimo, as we often see by non-Catholics um, and, and in the Republican Party. So now stepping back and saying, okay, well, that was then, what do we think about Joe Biden's Catholicism now? And I think when I look at President Biden, I think what I'm seeing is, I'm not sure what the phrase would be, the opposite of buyer's remorse, maybe customer satisfaction, in that um, it seems like we're getting the economic progressive who sees an important role for government in securing the common good, you know, believes in these, um, Catholic social teaching principles that you're pointing out, Massimo, so many other people have, you know, eschewed. Um, so I think we're getting that, and especially when we look at his economic policies. So the, you know, stimulus package that's predicted to cut child poverty in half, um, the infrastructure bill, which we're hoping if passed can really bring back some middle-class jobs. My colleague, Michael Sean Winters, calls it Fratelli Tutti Economics. And I hope that phrase catches on. So I, I repeat it whenever I'm out speaking because it really does combine many of the principles of Catholic social teaching that were summarized and pointedly made in Pope Francis's recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti, um, with, uh, um, with the kinds of policies that uh, uh, Joe Biden is trying to do economically. So there's this um, criticism, rejection of trickle down uh, by both of them. When, Joe Biden got up and gave his, um, it wasn't the State of the Union speech, but the, the speech in January, he sound, you know, I felt like he was channeling Pope Francis there in his criticism of, you know, trickle down has not worked. So once again, uh, you know, and there's been some disconnects, so I don't want to uh, make it sound like he's the perfect Catholic. He's not Pope Francis, uh, nor should he be. Um, and specifically some of this stuff on immigration, the refusal initially to uh, raise the uh, uh, refugee ceiling numbers. I think things are not improving as quickly as we'd like to see at the border. Um, but for the most part, he's been able to avoid being lured into those culture war issues, um, despite <laughs> attempts by many, including our church leadership, to lure him into those battles, specifically about abortion. And with the Supreme Court agreeing to uh, hear the case that's going to be happening right as we move towards the midterms, I think that's going to be an increasingly difficult thing to avoid. But I know we'll talk more about that later, but those are my initial comments. Thank you very much, Heidi. And I'm also very happy to ask the same to you, uh, EJ. Um, uh, again, we're returning to the kind of very practical level. Um, Wondering how you respond to uh, to what uh, Massimo has opened up with. Now, I'm sorry, I was uh, okay. muted because our dog was barking. Okay, I didn't want the dog, our dear dog, to interrupt Heidi. Uh, experience. 
Uh, the yes, I, I've I've joked many times that the one good thing about the pandemic, it's the only time in my life where people have told me to unmute myself. So, <laughs> I, uh, um, I, first of all, I want to say how great it is to be here. Uh, thanks to Bill Herbert, Her and that was very sweet of Harold Holzer, uh, whom I remember dearly and have watched. Uh, his book production uh, is extraordinary, and uh, his work on Lincoln is actually maybe relevant to what we're doing today. If I could shout out two of his books, um, Lincoln at Cooper Union, uh, which is on, these books are on these shelves that are in this room, uh, is one of the best books on how one speech helped create a national persona. It's a really fantastic book. And Lincoln and the power of the press uh, told the world that, that Lincoln was so aware of both the power of the press and ethnic politics that he actually bought a German language newspaper uh, because he understood how important the German vote was to the Republican party. Uh, so Harold, bless you for all of that. And what an honor to be with uh, Paul and Heidi and Massimo. Um, and Heidi, hold up the book again because Massimo is just not into the too. promotion yeah, that okay. is <laughs> necessary. And I forgot to put mine near me. Um, let me just say a couple of things. Um, the Massimo's book is extremely important for pointing out the central fact that we confront at this moment with the Biden presidency, which is the splits over Joe Biden are remarkably similar to the splits over the papacy uh, of uh, Pope Francis. Uh, the array of forces on opposite sides of the arguments about Biden are within the church are to a very substantial degree uh, like the arguments over Pope Francis. And um, that makes this, as Massimo argues in this important book, um, a very peculiar moment. Um, you know, we're in a very different time than we were earlier, as Massimo pointed out. Uh, Reinhold Niebuhr told the great story that uh, when Al Smith ran for president, um, anti-Catholics were trying to tie him to various uh, papal teachings, some of which were quite anti-democratic, small d. And Niebuhr tells the story of Al Smith being in a meeting with advisors and saying, will somebody just tell me one thing? What the hell is an encyclical? Um, so that would be a little different, I think, than our period now, but some things are constant. Um, there is, it is, it's, uh, it's said that John Kennedy was sitting down with some folks talking about um, the, Catholic, uh, the Catholic community and how strong his support would be. And he said, well, Nixon's got the bishops, but I've got the nuns. Uh, and I think that is certainly true uh, in the case of uh, uh, Joe Biden. Um, I, the, I think there are a couple of things. The, uh, also, just by the way, I, I'm so glad that Heidi mentioned Fratelli Tutti Economics. Uh, Michael Sean is a very good uh, coiner of phrases, but that is really, uh, I think, an excellent way to look at where Biden is. Uh, because that intervention in Fratelli Tutti, I read it at the time as uh, a kind of intervention in American politics. There were certain passages of that that you could read rather directly as a critique of Trump and Trumpism and what was going on um, in the Trump years. Um, and so I think that's, that's the right idea. Um, a couple of points. Um, it's very important to underscore Massimo's argument that there is in fact great continuity in Catholic social teaching, particularly on labor, uh, going all the way back to Rerum Novarum uh, in 1891. It's the 40th anniversary of uh, Pope uh, John Paul's encyclical uh, Laboram Exertens, forgive my Latin if I, I'm, I only took two years uh, in high school. Um, and, um, you know, this was a very important pro labor document. One sentence further consideration of this question should confirm our conviction of the priority of human labor over what in the course of time we have grown accustomed to calling capital. And by the way, about a Harry Holzer, Abraham Lincoln also talked about the priority of labor over uh, capital. Um, if you look at uh, Pope Benedict's teachings on economics, 
They were also very progressive. I, I happened to write a column when Obama, President Obama visited uh, with um, um, uh, Pope Benedict in Rome. And I said, one of these people is to the left of the other on economics. And it was in fact, Pope Benedict who was to the left of Barack Obama uh, in his economic views. So this is a very consistent line in Catholic uh, social teaching. And I always thought that, uh, you know, Pope John Paul, whom correctly in many ways we see as a conservative, um, nonetheless set up what I thought in his encyclical Centesimus Annus, the framework of the debate among Catholics. And it ran from um, a kind of social democracy or democratic socialism on the left, as long as um, those social democrats or socialists uh, recognized limits on state power. Um, but it accepted very broad intervention. And then it ran to the right to what you might call a semi-pro-capitalist Christian democracy, as long as it accepted the need for a strong safety net and regulation. Um, and that is the kind of, argue, those are the kind of boundaries of the traditional Catholic argument, if you will. You know, a kind of Christian democracy and a kind of social democracy or democratic socialism. Um, ever since in the American church, um, ever since the Catholic bishop's statement on the economy back in um, uh, the 1980s, uh, you saw the emergence of a much more, a stronger pro-capitalist argument uh, from the late Mike Novak, from the late Father Richard Newhouse, um, although even that argument, I think, was less right wing. It was still more conscious of the limitations put on a right wing uh, economic view than the current versions that Massimo uh, is talking about. And one other shout out to the past, um, Lou Daly, the author of God's Economy, has written that the 1919 Catholic bishops program for social reconstruction I'd love the American bishops to use that word one of these days against social reconstruction. Um, Lou Daly argues, I think quite rightly, that that program really laid the basis for the New Deal. There is so much in what the bishops said in 1919, our bishops, American bishops, that led up to New Deal thinking. So I think three things have happened, and then I'll stop. Um, um, you know, first, the rise of the abortion issue, which is a real split in uh, American life. Among Catholics, it's, Catholics tend not to challenge the church's direct view on abortion. Uh, they uh, do challenge, and Pope Francis has challenged, the priority that is given to abortion over every other question. Um, and I think part of the controversy over Pope Francis is Pope Francis has taken a decisive step back toward where the American bishops might have been placed in the 1980s, saying abortion matters, but it is not the only issue. It is not necessarily the most important issue. Um, and that really puts him crosswise with uh, many American Catholics. I think the second point is um, for many American Catholics, there is no doubt this is an absolutely rock bottom um, uh, conviction. Uh, but I think it's also the case that the abortion issue is often weaponized against uh, the Catholic left, if you will, or Catholic liberals. Um, by making it a priority, it is used to downplay the importance uh, of traditional Catholic social teaching. Um, and I think that is what is happening with Joe Biden. Uh, the third point I want to make and last point um, is about Joe Biden himself. Um, and what makes it very hard for Joe Biden's Catholic critics is he looks like such a Catholic guy that every Catholic in America knows in their heart, has met at some point in their life. Joe Biden looks like the guy passing, collect, doing the collection at the 11 o'clock mass. <laughs> Joe Biden looks like the guy who coached one of your kids in CYO basketball. Joe Biden looks like that guy. He talks like that guy. Um, and so it's very hard to demonize Joe Biden as some alien cultural figure uh, for most American Catholics. They know who he is. 
And as somebody who gets the Vatican, the uh, press uh, readouts every day from you know uh, reporters, God bless my colleagues who cover Biden everywhere. Uh, it's so much fun to see you know Joe Biden attended mass at five o'clock on this night. And it, uh, it's not only on Sundays, it's also on every holy day of obligation, uh, Joe Biden is there. Um, so that I think complicates things for his critics. Secondly, Joe Biden really is a two Johns Catholic. Uh, some of you may remember that phrase uh, from Gary Wills' great book from long ago, Bear Ruined Choirs. Um, and he spoke of the two Johns, John F. Kennedy and John the 23rd. Um, and in that book, he used it with a sort of a hint of criticism. Uh, but there is no question that Joe Biden was formed by the Catholicism that was a very healthy self, you know, very self-conscious on the rise in American life Catholicism of the uh, John F. Kennedy election uh, era. Um, and also uh, of Vatican II. And I suspect that most of the priests Joe Biden had over time uh, were priests uh, from Vatican II. Uh, and so I'll close by saying, you know, the real question in some ways is, will Joe Biden be the last Catholic, uh, a representative figure of the last Catholic of a certain era? Um, will American Catholicism in fact, change fundamentally. Will, with the defection of so many younger, more progressive Catholics, their departure uh, from the church, um, will this church that is so familiar in Joe Biden uh, become unrecognizable uh, to many of us who grew up in it? Uh, or will Joe Biden and Pope Francis, and this gets us back to Massimo's book, because this is kind of where he ends up, um, you know, will uh, Joe Biden and Pope Francis mark the beginning of something new, uh, which combines some of that old Catholicism with a much greater sensitivity to the importance of non-Western, non-Northern uh, parts of the world uh, to American Catholicism? And I think that's the fight and the argument that we are in the middle of. And if I may use the phrase, God bless Massimo, uh, for helping to clarify some of the issues that we confront. Thanks very much, EJ. You know, um, I'd like to start off a bit of a discussion now, and really, if our if our uh, audience would like to uh, send in questions, uh, that would be great. Um, but for now, I, I wonder if we could focus a little more on um, labor issues uh, and how Joe Biden's Catholicism, I would like to say uh, Irish Catholicism, uh, that kind of Scranton Joe uh, thing, um, maybe shaping his his presidency and, and and how he how he approaches labor issues. I just one short passage from Massimo's book. I'm on the bottom of page uh, 43, and he refers to uh, uh, Biden running for vice president in 2008. Uh, brings to the Catholic ticket not only his Catholicism but also credentials as a moderate to help bridge the ideological divide with conservatism in America. He goes on to say, this was the world from which Biden had come, typical of the Catholicism marked by the social teaching of the church, starting with Pope Leo XIII's Rerum Novarum. Economic progressivism in support of the working class or blue collar workers, emphasizing issues like wages, trade unions, and workers' rights. Uh, it seems to me Joe Biden may be kind of unique uh, or unusual among American presidents in his uh, approach to labor. Can you, panelists, talk about that a bit? Massimo, go ahead. <laughs> sure. So here, I'm not an expert of American social or economic history, but he comes from a background that is very different from, from John Kennedy, for example. In some sense, he's closer to to Al Smith, I mean, socially, that's, uh, here the whole question is, uh, I mean, the whole perception of where to locate ideologically the issue of workers' rights, workers' unions and so on, has changed really in these last uh, 12 or, or 15 years because of the, op um, 
openly evident in crisis of uh, globalization. So this is something that is harder on the left, on progressives, because we know that the usual or the easier answer of, of the right or, or of the Catholic right is, is nationalism, ethno-nationalism, and, and, and this protectionism. So on the right, there are more available options uh, for a Catholic, a progressive uh, or center left like Joe Biden, it is more complicated. And so certainly I believe that he works as a trade union, as, as, as a synthesis between an old uh, 20th century kind of uh, American Catholicism, the Catholic ghetto, the nuns running schools and so on, and the 21st century, which, which is more uncertain. But we have roughly a, a, an idea of, of what that synthesis looks like. But on social economic issues, I believe there's a huge question mark because, and this is also the problem of, of Europe, the current I mean, prime minister of Italy, Mario Draghi, is a student of, of, of the Jesuits, but he comes from Goldman Sachs. And so, and, and he gets along very well with Pope Francis, but his background is exactly the opposite of Joe Biden. <laughs> and so, I mean, how do you locate a Catholic progressive social justice uh, set of policies? It has become really, really complicated. Thank you, Massimo. Heidi or EJ, would you? Want to jump in on that? Well, I'll jump in a, a little bit and also respond to EJ in that we see this move in American Catholicism away from the Democratic Party and towards the Republican Party in the 80s. And it's easy to say, well, that's about the pro-life issue, that's about abortion. And it is to some degree, but it's also about moving from being a church primarily made out of working class immigrants to uh, uh, Catholics having moved into the middle class and even management and now being in the upper class. And so you have a different perspective about workers' rights, I think, as you know, people individually or as a group move, uh, move that from in that class uh, change. I think the, the teaching of the church remains the same, but it's, it's more disconnected from people's everyday lives. But what I'm, what I'm wondering if we're seeing um, with the pandemic is a reawakening to these concerns and these issues. And obviously it was happening before the pandemic with the, with the growing income inequality in our country, in our world. And, and, and so the issues, economic issues being front and center again. But when you look at the, um, you know, the idea of what do we do when we have a pandemic, we hoard, you know, toilet paper or, or the gas, you know, people start hoarding the gas recently. And instead you have Catholic social teaching that comes in and says, no, we you're not in this alone. We're in this as a community, there's a common good. Um, you see all these articles about families struggling, women homeschooling and trying to work from home and, and being kind of left on their own to try to navigate the pandemic. And, and you realize then that so, some of these Catholic social teachings about the limits of market solutions to everything or and the importance of the dignity of work have something to say. Um, more recently with this, this whole uh, labor shortage that uh, uh, many people, including the New York Times today are talking about is not really a labor shortage. It's a, a lack of good paying jobs that provide the kind of benefits that someone needs to, to consider taking it. Um, I think that there could be a resurgence of this and Joe Biden with his background um, you know, could be a person to, to make that link. Um, but again, I'm just gonna throw in there, I think the lure of the uh, you know, culture war issues is strong and, that, and, that, and it's easy to get diverted from that conversation by all these little fires popping up everywhere. Although Biden has done a great job of ig ignoring them for the most part. Yeah. Could I just underscore something by Heidi said, because I utterly agree with that. I think it is very important to trace the different class situation of American Catholics in uh, 2021 uh, versus 1980 versus 1960 and going back earlier. 1960 may have been kind of the optimal time in a certain way in that you still had a substantial Catholic working class uh, and a lot of the leadership of the trade union movement was Catholic. 
uh, but you had the beginnings of this, you really had the rise of a Catholic middle class then that continued. And so there's no question about that class shift that explains some of the political shift. Uh, I've seen evidence in some of the work I did that also as Catholics move away from the communities of original immigration in the Northeast and Midwest to the South or the West, uh, their democratic loyalties also began to dissipate. Uh, and so there's a lot to that. And you see it among the bishops themselves. A friend who worked for the church for many years made the point that um, going back and say, even in the 1980s, when all of those progressives encyclicals were being written, a lot of those bishops had working class parents. Uh, the new generation of bishops tend not to come from the working class, some do obviously, and I don't, I have not personally done a study of this, although I think there is some work on this, uh, tend to come much more from that um, more affluent class of Catholics that Heidi uh, referred to. So I think that's very important. Um, Paul mentioned his Irish Catholicism um, as, as the Marxists like to say, it's no accident that the Secretary of Labor is named Marty Walsh. Um, and I wish I could retrieve my old Massachusetts accent to pronounce Marty's name right. Um, you know, and so I think that Joe you know, Biden really is marinated um, in that uh, in that tradition. Uh, it's the one he speaks about. And um, you know, I'm I've covered Biden for a long time. I joke I'm so old that I covered Biden when he was the new generation candidate back in 1987. Um, and. Uh, Every time there were so many moments when Biden would criticize upscale liberals, um, uh, both in public and in private, for not understanding the people he grew up with. Uh, and he is, uh, I think, in, in a good way, obsessed with the people he grew up with um, in terms of the challenges they have faced in the new economy. Um, but I also think he's extended that and sees in Black Americans and Latinos uh, the struggles that uh, of the people he grew up with and the fact that Black voters always supported him in Delaware, which is very important to a politician's conception of whose um, interests uh, he, he represents. Um, and so, I, again, the question is, will Biden help revive uh, the old pro-labor tradition of the church. Um, one person I would shout out in closing is Cardinal Supich out in uh, Chicago, uh, who has given some really interesting speeches uh, about labor um, that really resonate with the great Catholic social tradition. I think it'll be interesting if other, um, you know, there may be other bishops out there whose work I'm not familiar with, um, but this ought to be a moment, as Heidi said, after the pandemic, uh, where uh, the church's traditional teaching on labor really ought to resonate. And Biden is clearly carrying that in his, um, you know, in the back of his mind, which might also be referred to as his conscience. <laughs> you, you think these Catholic teachings on, uh, on labor, the right to organize, living wage, all these, do you think they are in any way inspiring the more progressive wing of the Democratic Party, uh, uh, at least among uh, Catholic uh, politicians and activists? I'll just jump in real quick because I, I think the answer is yes and no. Um, mm -hmm. I think Catholic social thought is the best kept secret of the Catholic Church, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, and I think an awful, I've had students who had never confronted uh, uh, Catholic social thought in any of their CCD classes, let alone people outside the church. A friend of mine who's Baptist loves to teach Catholic social thought to Baptist seminary students because they find it an inspiration and a surprise. Um, the second thing, and, and I think this is part of the crisis the church confronts, a lot of younger Catholics who might carry this tradition forward are not Catholic anymore. Uh, and I, can, I, I imagine if we, again, if we did a survey, we would find that many of the social justice advocates out there, many of the young people working in the labor movement might actually come from Catholic backgrounds, but don't think of themselves as Catholic anymore. Um, and I think that's the larger challenge to progressive uh, Catholicism, that uh, there are more people in that category who are Joe Biden's age than who are 25 or 27 years old. 
Uh, and right. so I wonder how much memory there is of this, both among Catholics, but also uh, certainly outside the church. Okay. Good. Um, may... Yes, Massimo. Yeah, this is very important because it's a problem of, of a certain interruption of between generations in American Catholicism. And that has something to do, I think, uh, also with Pope Francis, because there's an alignment between Joe Biden and Pope Francis on social issues, economic issues. But, and I, I wrote about this in, in the book, there is really a disconnect between the Catholic culture of uh, progressives in this country and of Joe Biden on women in the church, for example, which doesn't find really a partner in the Vatican because this is one of the, of the, of the typical uh, features of this pontificate of Francis, incredibly courageous, open on social issues out in the world and within the church structures, uh, there's a real reluctance to make changes that correspond to the modern contemporary culture um, of uh, people of the age of our students um, or, 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 or young voters. So here there is a series of advantages for, for Joe Biden of having for, uh, Pope Francis as a Pope, but there are also some disadvantages uh, that are becoming, I would, I would say, increasingly visible as this, as this pontificate progresses. It has become now evident that there are some issues where Pope Francis doesn't want to go. And this affects also a certain credibility of Catholic leadership in this country, not just of our bishops, but also of a very particular kind of Catholic leadership, which which is of, of our second Catholic president. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Massimo. Heidi, I'd love to hear Heidi on that. because Okay, and I'd like to jump to the questions from our audience, but yes, Heidi? Well, just to touch on the generational issue, I mean, Massimo is correct. You, when you have a church that um, in its own leadership or in some of its teachings is seen as not pro-woman and not pro-LGBTQ, you're gonna have a really hard time reaching out to young progressives. And then on top of it in the US, where you have the church and increasingly with the young conservative priests who are coming out of our seminaries being associated with the Republican party and with the MAGA movement, then what is attractive in this church? You know, I wrote a column that said, hey, progressive Catholicism, we've been here all along and it struck a nerve. And I heard from young people who said, oh my God, I never heard of this. But I think we're gonna have to, I mean, labor, economic issues, that's part of it. But I think we're going to have to address some of these other issues around gender and sexuality, but even more so about race. This is becoming the, the issue that is really um, important in our country to, the, to that generation of young progressives. And I think it's really been there all along. I mean, we can talk about, yes, it was libertarianism. Yes, it was abortion. But a lot of the shifts that we've seen over the years, 60s to 80s to today, were really about race, too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we're getting some interesting questions and I, I'd like to introduce one to you and all, uh, now, but also uh, if I could ask Mac, Mac Barrett to, uh, to join us. Thank you, Mac. Uh, yes. There's one question I, I wanted to focus on, Mac, that uh, kind of responds directly to the, some of the discussion we were just having. Um, but those progressive encyclicals were challenged by think tanks and Michael Novak. Can you speak to the top-down challenges to the economic justice teachings of the church. Panelists, can you respond to that? Oh. Well, sorry. Go ahead, Massimo, you go first. So, I mean, there's a whole history of the perversions of a Catholic teaching that were sold to the American public by a certain group of, of intellectuals, in some cases in, in good faith, in other cases, in bad faith. And so there's a history uh, and that has to be written from a Catholic perspective of those who, who recognize now the fruits of those very peculiar interpretation. Uh, and I refer here to, I mean, George Weigel, especially 
but he's not the only one and so he's, he's the most important. And so that has been a planned intervention. It didn't happen uh, by accident uh, and it, it's still operating. I, I once got to tell Mike Novak uh, that um, he, and actually I did this in acknowledgement of a book too, but I told Mike that he persuaded me to many of the views I now hold, which in most cases are views he now rejects, uh, because it's worth remembering that Mike was a real lefty uh, in his youth, um, a, uh, uh, you know, a progressive activist in the anti-war movement. He worked for Sergeant Shriver during the McGovern campaign in 1972, and then had his own journey toward the right that eventually led uh, uh, to uh, his book on capitalism in 1981. Mike, so Mike is a really interesting thinker. The same trajectory was followed by Father Newhouse. Um, you know, I dare say Father Newhouse was probably to my left when I was young and ended up obviously far to my right when, uh, uh, before he died. Um, and I think that uh, the 1980s were sort of the crucible of this, where you had people like Mike, uh, you know, whom I really loved as a human being, I should just say, uh, and um, you know, and the who were wanted the church to be less critical of the market. Uh, and there's a great document that's worth looking at that was this conservative critique. And it was a bunch of conservative intellectuals. I think James Q. Wilson was involved, Mike Novak was involved, some AEI folks criticizing the Catholic bishop's letter. And it was like an alternative letter uh, that was put out by conservative Catholics defending the market. And when um, John Paul uh, II's um, uh, in, uh, encyclical um, Sentesimo Sanus came out, uh, the conservative Catholics claimed a victory uh, because Pope John Paul spoke of a right to personal initiative. Um, and Novak argued, I don't think wrongly, that the uh, Pope John Paul's encyclical was somewhat more sympathetic to market economics than the long trajectory of Catholic social teaching has been. On the other hand, you know, Father Hare, Father Brian Hare argued it was still uh, critical of capitalism in many aspects. That's where I, I think, so you began this journey um, in the 1980s um, on the part of people like Mike and Father Newhouse. Um, and now I think it's hit, and here's where Heidi's work, I think, picks right up on it and NCR's work. Yes. Um, it's now moved to, I think, an even more radical place than those folks were back in the 80s. Uh, um, and it's a much stronger pushback against uh, the Catholic social tradition. Heidi, is that, would you read the history that way? Yes, and I was part of that history. This is where I have to reveal that I had Michael Novak as a teacher when I was a senior at, or a junior at the University of Notre Dame. And I did an internship. This is going to be shocking to everyone I know. <laughs> summer internship at Crisis Magazine, um, a very, you know, right-wing Catholic magazine. And uh, Michael Novak, of course, then helped me to realize how much of a progressive I was as well, because I, I did not agree with much of what I was proofreading there. He invited me um, to be in a, a very entry-level job at the American Enterprise Institute after I graduated, which I politely declined. So I will say, yes, that this was in the late 80s. But yes, that is the history. Um, and George Weigel, of course, has been doing this for decades. But I think what we're seeing recently isn't just the extreme positions taken by some on the right now in terms of their um, total rejection of some of this Catholic social teaching, but the way the message is spread now through social media, through so-called media, you know, companies, whether it's like EWTN or some of this life site news, you know, that this kind, this kind of thing, the way that this is getting disseminated now, it's not a discussion among Newhouse and other people who are at think tanks or at universities. It's getting out to everyday Catholics. They're maybe looped in with the abortion issue. And before you know it, they're rejecting pretty much all of Catholic social teaching. And as Massimo says, rejecting the legitimate legitimacy of the Pope. I mean, Imagine how ironic it is for us at NCR, which of course throughout our 
57 year history have often been very critical of some parts of the of popes or the papal papacies, especially their teaching about issues around women, uh, for example, that were in this position now trying to defend the institution of the papacy against so called conservative Catholics. It's just um, upside down land, isn't it? I once told Ross Douth that, that he told me I needed to pay attention to Benedict, so I told him he should pay attention to Francis. It's a very <laughs> interesting uh, flip. <laughs> uh, Mac? Yeah, um, Paul, so how about I read a few more questions that have come in from the audience? Okay. That would be great, thank you. Sure, so here's one from Greg Denier. You've discussed the role that class has played, but don't you think coming in response to the civil rights movement of the 1960s that race also played a role to shifting the Catholic white vote to Republicans. I, could I just say, I want Heidi to pick that up 100%. I mean, if you look at Nixon's strategy in 1968, at the time they referred to it as an appeal to the peripheral urban ethnics. Uh, the peripheral urban ethnics were heavily Catholic. And the you, if you, you know, the high point of Catholic voting for Democrats was John F. Kennedy, at 78%, where lots of Catholics voted for Kennedy just because they wanted to tear down the barrier, including conservatives. LBJ held most of that vote in 64, but it fell below 50% with Humphrey, it fell below 60% with Humphrey, and Nixon actually carried the Catholic vote against McGovern um, in uh, 1972. Some of that was abortion and traditionalism, but there was no question that there was a backlash against race and that you saw that um, in a lot of communities from, um, you know, for, throughout the Northeast and Midwest uh, in particular. So yes, a racial backlash was part of the Catholic defection um, from the Democratic Party. And essentially the Catholic vote now, I always joke that there is no Catholic vote and it's important. Uh, because the Catholic vote is a kind of 40-40-20 vote. It's hard for Democrats to drop below 40. It's hard for Republicans to drop below 40. There's a big swing vote. So it's not a block anymore, but it's important because in part because of where Catholics are located. Uh, I will only mention Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, uh, but also Arizona, actually, uh, as examples of where Catholics are. Uh, but Heidi, you alluded to this first, and I I think it's very important that the that the whole issue of race. Yeah, and I think I, again I'm going to quote my colleague Michael Sean uh, Winters, who I think has used the term totem t o t e m to refer to abortion as like this issue that signals a whole bunch of other things. So if this if the candidate is pro life and with us on abortion, they're kind of with us on our general view of the world and the role of government and 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 really. Our, our view, I'm, I'm not speaking personally here, that the fear that white Christian America is going away. And that is uh, very much about race, I believe. I think what's interesting to look at in the future is the role of Latinos, specifically Latino Catholics, but also as Latinos like white people are leaving uh, Catholicism in some numbers that are should be concerning. Um, so often when we talk about the Catholic vote or Catholic beliefs, we're talking about white Catholics and we increasingly need to be talking about Latino Catholics. There's more of them. They're going to be the majority very soon in our, uh, they already are in our church, especially if you look at younger age demographics. There was some recent um, Biden approval rating data from Pew that I was looking at in preparation. And it was showing that among white Catholics, there's a 51% approval rating for Biden. This was from April, a little bit old. Um, but, and, and it was showing that that's very similar to what white uh, Catholics had approval rating for Trump in April of 2017. So right there, just over half. But what was interesting is that the Latino Catholic approval rating for Biden, 80%. And even more interesting is that they didn't even se separate that out in 2017 and measure it separately. So we need to be always asking that demographic question now and looking at, at that issue uh, racially as well. Somebody actually has just written in a, a question on that very issue. Kay Lobach asks, what has been or will be the influence of Latin Catholics on these issues? 
Could we ask the man whose name ends in a vowel to answer that question first? <laughs> yeah. So I believe that it's, it's indisputable that the future of the Catholic Church and of this country depends largely on, uh, on those that we call Latinos, which, which means a, a lot of different things because it means, I mean, Central America, Latin America, Caribbean, says uh, the Spanish speaking, Portuguese speaking. So this is really um, at the center of the future uh, of our politics and of our church. And so that is, I believe, the one of the key factors that has made a change from the, the, the way Catholic politics was perceived until 10 or 15 years ago. So this now, I mean, numbers say that in a very few years, the majority of church going Catholics in this country will be Latinos. This is an immense, immense change that affects not just uh, church finances, but also the self-perception, uh, who we are, who we're supposed to be, what's our role in, in the world. This is something that I believe Biden and the EP and, and those around him, his campaign knew, knew very well. Uh. I'm curious what you think about this, EJ, in part because I think there's a lot of um, somewhat dis disagreement about that. So this assumption that Latino Catholics will be Democrats um, was somewhat challenged by some of the data from the 2020 election and uh, especially in specific areas and not just the Cuban Americans in parts of Florida, but also some uh, Mexican American places along the border in Texas. And, you know, so there's some, you know, data that shows that Latino Catholics can be more conservative, conservative on some of these culture war issues. And so it, it kind of fits with your thesis, Massimo, is like, the, and this question that you're raising, EJ, is will Pope Francis and Joe Biden connect the economic issues and make them more front and center for that growing population, both young Catholics and Latino Catholics. Well, and what's interesting about that number, thank you, by the way, what's interesting about the number you cited is that 80% is higher than Biden's share of the Latino vote in the election. Right. Uh, so that what that, uh, you know, it's too way too early to tell, but you wonder if he's consolidated back some of that support already or not. We'll find out soon. Um, the um, the historically, the split in the Latino vote was Catholic uh, evangelical. Uh, when George W. Bush was winning around 40% plus of the Latino vote uh, when he ran in uh, 2000 and 2004, uh, he did that because he won uh, Latino evangelicals by almost two thirds of that vote. But Latino Catholics were still democratic. Um, this new configuration where it looks like Trump may have won uh, close to or under a third, but you know somewhere in the 30s. And you're right, there was obviously something big going on in South Florida, um, uh, particularly not only among Cuban Americans, but also among Venezuelans and Colombians. Uh, um, but then the South Texas thing, I think, took Democrats completely uh, by surprise. Um, uh, you know, one of the uh, part of it, I think, is religious traditionalism, and that we will, uh, you know, I think, keeping an eye on that just as analysts to see how much that influences the Latino vote. And I suspect you're going to see um, Republicans and conservatives really making an appeal there. Um, I think some of it is com uh, complex views on immigration among. Uh, uh, Latino Americans who have been here a long time, and I think that's worthy of study, and some on crime. Um, and perhaps even in some places, um, you know, there are conflicts between uh, Black Americans and Latino Americans. And so all of that is uh, going on. And obviously, parts of the Latino community are very entrepreneurial and business oriented. So, you know, you could argue that the surprising thing may not be that um, you know, Republicans got a third of the vote, but that it hasn't been higher given all those forces uh, that were going on there. Having said all that, it's really important to note that uh, uh, Biden wouldn't have carried 
uh, Arizona without his overwhelming Latino vote. He wouldn't have carried Nevada without his, the overwhelming share of the uh, Latino vote. Um, you can apply it to other states as well. Those are the two obvious ones. Um, and so, um, so they are still democratic. There is some change going on. Um, and lastly, um, a simple point, Latinos are one big group. It's like saying that Heidi and I are both Euro-Americans, um, you know, and, but, you know, Heidi's people came from one part of the world. My people came from the other part of the world. Now we are just sort of, we can lump us together as whites. Latinos are from a lot of different places with a lot of different histories. And you've seen differences in the Latino vote going back a long way. So not all of this uh, is new. I would just add among those things you listed uh, that was attractive to Latinos or repellents who would be especially the Cuban Americans was that the connection of Biden with socialism. Yes. And you saw that also with yeah. what's a much smaller in number group, but like Vietnamese Catholics, that's also true in the Asian American community. Um, I and Colombians and Venezuelans, 100%. Yes. 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 If you, if you do think, and I, and I think you're right to say it's way too early to get excited about this, that that 80% approval rating among Latino Catholics is evidence of a shift. I, and and, and it, if it has shifted from the election until now, it hasn't been because Biden is talking about abortion. So he's been doing economic policies that are helping people who are struggling. So I think that could be encouraging for your question about whether Biden can uh, sort of reclaim some of that tradition. Paul, could I ask Massimo a quick question on that? Sure. Because uh, I, uh, I am struck by the same thing. What's really striking with Biden about abortion is how rarely that word has passed his lips in this entire period. Uh, and I kind of don't think that's an accident, but uh, I'd be curious how you read uh, that. Some on the left are disappointed by that, but yes. Sure, that's true. I mean, uh, most of, of these recent statements on they should go back to 2015. So on the record uh, in, in interviews. Um, now, this is interesting. Uh, it's also interesting that he has crafted his position in a way that's different from the position of Nancy Pelosi, for example. Uh, that has argued for a compatibility between uh, abortion, legal abortion, and uh, and uh, Catholic teaching. This is not Joe Biden's position, uh, and so you see uh, an intelligent nuance there. It's interesting that he has never challenged the teaching of the church on that. He he just said. As a politician, I cannot legislate on the basis of my church teaching. So uh, it's, it's a silence, but uh, he has left a track record, which, which says something on how, how aware he is uh, of, of, of the complexity of the issue. Um, Mac, I was wondering if we, we could ask uh, Massimo about that question from Len Paolillo. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. I'll read that one now. Len Palio asks, uh, given his background, to what extent do you think Joe Biden will openly use Catholic teaching and pro-labor clergy in pushing for pro-labor legislation, or will he not openly mention or use it? That's a very good question. So uh, what we know historically that, I mean, John Kennedy, after being elected president, he sent signal that his policies were not influenced by, by Catholic teaching. He, he was not legislating for Catholics. It's different now because um, there, uh, Catholic teaching has, has become on those issues, especially anti-sectarian, non-sectarian. It's not a, a teaching for Catholics or for Catholic workers, but for human beings, one human family and so on. So, it, it would be easier. I suspect that he will do that in a, in a hidden way. Also because this is something I admire about Joe Biden's Catholicism. He's not, he's, he's not willing to compromise the authority of the church and of the papacy for his political 
uh, positions, his policies. This is something that I think it's very Catholic. So I, I don't expect he will do that. I agree with EJ that the choice by Pope Francis of publishing the encyclical Fratelli Tutti in the middle of the campaign was a surprise because I expected he would wait uh, until late November, December. So they understand one another, but they know also what are the, the, the boundaries of the other one. And so I, I, I don't expect Joe Biden to become too confessional in his argument for some policies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, would, I would agree yeah. with that. I, I think he has to balance using his faith and being uh, authentic about his faith, but recognizing that so many in his party are not religious people or people of another faith or people who are even hostile to religion. So that's a, a balancing act. Thank you. Uh, Mac? Yeah, so the next course? question um, from Vanessa Wiberly Denier. Can you speak to Joe Biden's relationship with the nuns, specifically network lobby for Catholic social justice, their push for economic justice, and how that compares to the US CCB's approach to the Biden administration and their discussions of and their discussions on denying communion to Catholic Democrats? I defer to Heidi. <laughs> well, there's new leadership at the um, Catholic at, at the network. So um, Sister Simone has stepped down and Mary, somebody help me with her last name. New is the new leader of, um, of, the, of the network group. I think that Joe Biden had a lot of support from women religious in the campaign and continues to on these very issues that we've been talking about. So network um, has prioritized economic poverty issues and so uh, if they're with Joe Biden on these issues, I think you're going to see some synergy there. Um, in terms of the denying communion debate, this is the whole uh, culture war seeping into uh, the discussion, right? And I will tell you, I've done probably more stories about that than I have about Joe Biden's economic policy, because it's newsworthy, and it's uh, got conflict, and it is, uh, it's concerning to our readers. That, that, that the bishops, even in, um, in light of this most recent intervention from the Vatican with this letter from Ladaria from the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith to say to slow down, I haven't seen any slowing down since the Ladaria letter. And there's some concern that they're gonna move forward uh, in the June meeting. The US bishops will just move forward with their plans to still try to have some sort of conversation document, uh, call it what you will about uh, communion for pro-choice politicians. So um, I think he, I think the the people who want to turn the conversation back to the economic issues um, will would are are the same people who would be concerned about the denying of communion. But I think it is unfortunate that if that takes center stage, that's when the secular press gets involved and does the big flashy story. I just uh, on the question, th I, I agree with everything Heidi said as I usually do. Um, the, um, you know, the, the progressive sisters and the bishops, I was trying to think of all the opposite words, up, down, in, out, night, day. I mean, it's just ra as radically different as you could be. And I think what's been very important about activist sisters, beginning with Sister Simone and the nuns on the bus, is they complicated press narratives about Catholics and politics, because in the campaigns, uh, earlier campaigns in the 2000s, the most outspoken bishops were the conservative or right-wing bishops. And therefore they tended to set the tone for quotes, what the church thinks. I think the nuns have played a very important role in complicating that narrative. Um, Sister Carol over at the Catholic Health Association on Obamacare is a good case in point in complicating that narrative because they have lifted up um, lifted up Catholic social thought. And I meant to say this earlier to under, uh, you know, I think the themes of Massimo's book have come to life right before our eyes, because when you look at the splits among the bishops uh, over the communion issue, they are the splits among the bishops over Pope Francis, who has been most critical of the Biden critics or of those who want to deny communion. Um, it's people 
uh, like uh, Cardinal Supich, it's people like Cardinal Tobin, it's people like Bishop McElroy. Uh, these are all Francis bishops saying, would you please stop to the communion, you know, to the excommunicators, if you will. Uh, and so I think you're seeing play out right among the bishops. You know, Biden is almost, I'm curious what Massimo thinks, it's almost a stand in for the other arguments. And it's interesting that in this particular field, uh, the possibility of Francis of appointing new bishops had a very minimal effect or zero effect. Because if you look at the New Archbishop of Philadelphia, Perez, uh, he is constantly overshadowed by his predecessor, Archbishop Chaput, who just today published a very strong article questioning the orthodoxy of the Catholic teaching of the former Holy Office. This is where we are. So this is a very complicated situation because uh, once you have challenged the legitimacy of, of Pope Francis, you have broken the ultimate taboo. You, 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 you can challenge the Vatican, the CDF, everyone. And so it's really not clear what's going to happen in these next few weeks, because this could really escalate uh, to a dramatic level the status of, of internal division in this church. You know, we just have a, we just have a few minutes um, left, but I was wondering, uh, for people who may not, for our, for our audience who may not be uh, familiar with these kind of internal debates among, among Catholics, what, what, what does all this matter to them? Well, it matters because the Catholic Church in this country is the single largest church in this country, one. Uh, second is the most, most global religious community. So what happens here as affects in, in other countries, other continents. Um, and, and then there's a, a political consciousness of Catholicism that is very different from the evangelical or, or, the, or, or the Protestant. So there is a political saliency that sets a certain tone in the national conversation, not just in the US, but everywhere. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would just add that, that it affects everyday people in the pew because what we're, you know, are we moving from this soft schism to a, you know, an actual schism when we, you mentioned today's article by Shapu. And, and, and even if it's just soft or functional, it, what you're seeing in your everyday parish is reflective of these same divisions. And so you, and especially if you don't live in a city where you have choices of parishes, you may be going to a parish that has a very MAGA flavor and that's going to affect you even if you don't follow the Catholic minutia stuff. And, and as EJ has said, with the importance of the swing part of the Catholic vote that doesn't exist, but is so important, um, that's going to affect the leadership of our country. And then of course, affect you in your everyday life too. Mm -hmm. Mary Novak, she's the new head of-, of Oh, Netflix. thank you. She's not a sister, which is interesting. So. Right. And EJ? Um, uh, obviously what has just been said about the importance of the Catholic church as a global institution, even if you're a purely Machiavellian, uh, in your view, you got to worry about the Catholic Church and think about what impact it has in a lot of places. Um, and at its best, the Catholic Church has been able to play remarkably constructive roles in trying to ease conflicts in certain places and speaking up against dictatorships uh, when it chose to uh, in rallying people to support uh, the poor people around the world. Um, these are very important these are very important roles the church can play, and it depends a lot on um, how willing the church is to speak up in those circumstances and to stand up for the oppressed. And here, uh, I think there are moments when even the most conservative and the most progressive Catholics can stand together in certain cases and have done so. Uh, and also simply in organizing uh, work on behalf of charity and justice, both in our country uh, and around the world. Again, uh, the Catholic Church is an extraordinary service provider, if you can use that ugly bureaucratic term, um, you know, both here and um, in situations of conflict. Um, the other is that 
Um, the Catholic Church can bring a corrective to the public conversation uh, when it's operating at its best. I've always joked that the Catholic Church's job is to make everybody left to right feel guilty about something in their um, political worldview. Mm -hmm. um, and it proves I am a Catholic because I'm using guilt as in a positive uh, sense. It just sort of should call everybody to conscience. And what I worry about now is that there's uh, something rather imbalanced about that. Um, and then the last point is, in so many ways, the struggles inside the church resemble other struggles going on outside the church. Uh, and uh, people who care about those struggles are going to care about them both inside and outside the church. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm afraid that we've, uh, we've run out of our time. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, our three panelists and, and Matt for, for you know, a wonderful job. Uh, thanks so much for writing this book, Massimo. Um, I would encourage people to read it because we've barely skimmed the surface of, of it there. It's, it's short. Heidi, bless you. Very uh, thought provoking. I have my copy with me too. Um, I feel like uh, a sinner. I ought to have mine too. Uh -oh. heard it aloft. <laughs> and, and also to, to read the works of uh, Heidi Schlump and uh, E.J. Dion. They, they both uh, brought so much to this conversation as well.